Appendix to Chapter 8 1. Kerensky's Advance On November 9 Kerensky and his Cossacks arrived at Kachina, where the garrison, hopelessly split into two factions, immediately surrendered. The members of the Gachina Soviet were arrested, and at first threatened with death, later they were released on good behavior. The Cossack advance guards, practically unopposed, occupied Pavlovsk, Alexandrovsk and other stations, and reached the outskirts of Tsarskoy Selo next morning, November 10. At once the garrison divided into three groups, the officers, loyal to Kerensky, part of the soldiers and non-commissioned officers, who declared themselves neutral. And most of the rank and file, who were for the Bolsheviki. The Bolshevik soldiers, who were without leaders or organization, fell back toward the capital. The local Soviet also withdrew to the village of Polkovo. From Polkovo, six members of the Tsarskoy Selo Soviet went with an automobile load of proclamations to Gachina, to propagandize the Cossacks. They spent most of the day going around Gachina from one Cossack barracks to another, pleading, arguing and explaining. Toward evening some officers discovered their presence and they were arrested and brought before General Krasnov, who said, You fought against Karnilov, now you are opposing Kerensky. I'll have you all shot. After reading aloud to them the order appointing him commander-in-chief of the Petrograd district, Krasnov asked if they were Bolsheviki. They replied in the affirmative, upon which Krasnov went away, a short time later an officer came and set them free, saying that it was by order of General Krasnov. In the meanwhile delegations continued to arrive from Petrograd, from the Duma, the Committee for Salvation, and, last of all, from the Vikshel. The Union of Railway Workers insisted that some agreement be reached to halt the civil war, and demanded that Kerensky treat with the Bolsheviki, and that he stop the advance on Petrograd. In case of refusal, the Vikshel threatened a general strike at midnight of November 11. Kerensky asked to be allowed to discuss the matter with the socialist ministers and with the Committee for Salvation. He was plainly undecided. On the 11th Cossack outposts reached Krasnoy Selo, from which the local Soviet and the heterogeneous forces of the Military Revolutionary Committee precipitately retired, some of them surrendering. That night they also touched Polkovo, where the first real resistance was encountered. Cossacks deserters began to dribble into Petrograd, declaring that Kerensky had lied to them, that he had spread broadcast over the front proclamations which said that Petrograd was burning. That the Bolsheviki had invited the Germans to come in, and that they were murdering women and children and looting indiscriminately. The Military Revolutionary Committee immediately sent out some dozens of agitators, with thousands of printed appeals, to inform the Cossacks of the real situation. 2. Proclamations of the Military Revolutionary Committee To all Soviets of workers, soldiers and peasants deputies. The All-Russian Congress of Soviets of Workers Soldiers and peasants' deputies charges the local Soviets immediately to take the most energetic measures to oppose all counter-revolutionary anti-Semitic disturbances. And all pogroms of whatever nature. The honor of the workers, peasants and soldiers' revolution cannot tolerate any disorders. The Red Guard of Petrograd, the revolutionary garrison and the sailors have maintained complete order in the capital. Workers, soldiers, and peasants, everywhere you should follow the example of the workers and soldiers of Petrograd. Comrade soldiers and Cossacks, on us falls the duty of keeping real revolutionary order. All revolutionary Russia and the whole world have their eyes on you. The All-Russian Congress of Soviets decrees. To abolish capital punishment at the front, which was reintroduced by Kerensky. Complete freedom of propaganda is to be re-established in the country. All soldiers and revolutionary officers now under arrest for so-called political crimes are at once to be set free. The ex-premier Kerensky, overthrown by the people, refuses to submit to the Congress of Soviets and attempts to struggle against the legal government elected by the All-Russian Congress, the Council of People's Commissars. The Front has refused to aid Kerensky. Moscow has rallied to the new government. In many cities, Minsk, Mogilev, Kharkov, the power is in the hands of the Soviets. 
No infantry detachment consents to march against the workers' and peasants' government, which, in accord with the firm will of the army and the people, has begun peace negotiations and has given the land to the peasants. We give public warning that if the Cossacks do not halt Kerensky, who has deceived them and is leading them against Petrograd, the revolutionary forces will rise with all their might for the defense of the precious conquests of the revolution, peace and land. Citizens of Petrograd Kerensky fled from the city, abandoning the authority to Kishkin, who wanted to surrender the capital to the Germans. Rudenberg, of the Black Band, who sabotaged the municipal food supply, and Polchinsky, hated by the whole democracy. Kerensky has fled, abandoning you to the Germans, to famine, to bloody massacres. The revolting people have arrested Kerensky's ministers, and you have seen how the order and supplying of Petrograd at once improved. Kerensky, at the demand of the aristocrat proprietors, the capitalists, speculators, marches against you for the purpose of giving back the land to the landowners. And continuing the hated and ruinous war. Citizens of Petrograd we know that the great majority of you are in favor of the people's revolutionary authority, against the Kornilovtsi led by Kerensky. Do not be deceived by the lying declarations of the impotent bourgeois conspirators, who will be pitilessly crushed. Workers, soldiers, peasants. We call upon you for revolutionary devotion and discipline. Millions of peasants and soldiers are with us. The victory of the people's revolution is assured. 3. Acts of the Council of People's Commissars. In this book I am giving only such decrees as are in my opinion pertinent to the Bolshevik conquest of power. The rest belong to a detailed account of the structure of the Soviet state, for which I have no place in this work. This will be dealt with very fully in the second volume, now in preparation, Karnilov to Brest-Litovsk. Concerning Dwelling Places. The independent municipal self-governments have the right to sequestrate all unoccupied or uninhabited dwelling places. The municipalities may, according to laws and arrangements established by them, install in all available lodging citizens who have no place to live, or who live in congested or unhealthy lodgings. The municipalities may establish a service of inspection of dwelling places, organize it and define its powers. The municipalities may issue orders on the institution of house committees, define their organization, their powers and give them juridical authority. The municipalities may create housing tribunals, define their powers and their authority. This decree is promulgated by telegraph. People's Commissar of the Interior A. I. Rykov On Social Insurance the Russian proletariat has inscribed on its banners the promise of complete social insurance of wage workers, as well as of the town and village poor. The government of the Tsar, the proprietors, and the capitalists, as well as the government of coalition and conciliation, failed to realize the desires of the workers with regard to social insurance. The workers' and peasants' government, relying upon the support of the Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies, announces to the working class of Russia and to the town and village poor that it will immediately prepare laws on social insurance based on the formulas proposed by the labor organizations. Insurance for all wage workers without exception. As well as for all urban and rural poor. Insurance to cover all categories of loss of working capacity, such as illness, infirmities, old age, childbirth, widowhood, orphanage, and unemployment all the costs of insurance to be charged to employers. Compensation of at least full wages in all loss of working capacity and unemployment. Complete workers' self-government of all insurance institutions. In the name of the government of the Russian Republic. The People's Commissar of Labor. Alexander Shlyapnikov. On Popular Education. Citizens of Russia. With the insurrection of November 7 the working masses have won for the first time the real power. The All-Russian Congress of Soviets has temporarily transferred this power both to its executive committee and to the Council of People's Commissars. By the will of the revolutionary people, I have been appointed People's Commissar of Education. 
the work of guiding in general the people's education, inasmuch as it remains with the central government, is, until the constituent assembly meets. Entrusted to a commission on the people's education, whose chairman and executive is the people's commissar. Upon what fundamental propositions will rest this state commission? How is its sphere of competence determined? The general line of educational activity, every genuinely democratic power must, in the domain of education, in a country where illiteracy and ignorance reign supreme. Make its first aim the struggle against this darkness. It must acquire in the shortest time universal literacy, by organizing a network of schools answering to the demands of modern pedagogics. It must introduce universal, obligatory and free tuition for all. And establish at the same time a series of such teachers' institutes and seminaries as will in the shortest time furnish a powerful army of people's teachers so necessary for the universal instruction of the population of our boundless Russia. Decentralization the State Commission on People's Education is by no means a central power governing the institutions of instruction and education. On the contrary, the entire school work ought to be transferred to the organs of local self-government. The independent work of the workers, soldiers and peasants, establishing on their own initiative cultural educational organizations, must be given full autonomy. Both by the state center and the municipal centers. The work of the State Commission serves as a link and helpmate to organize resources of material and moral support to the municipal and private institutions, particularly to those with a class character established by the workers. The State Committee on People's Education, a whole series of invaluable law projects was elaborated from the beginning of the revolution by the State Committee for People's Education, a tolerably democratic body as to its composition, and rich in experts. The State Commission sincerely desires the collaboration of this committee. It has addressed itself to the Bureau of the Committee. With the request at once to convoke an extraordinary session of the Committee for the fulfillment of the following program. The revision of rules of representation in the Committee. In the sense of greater democratization. The revision of the Committee's rights in the sense of widening them and of converting the committee into a fundamental state institute for the elaboration of law projects calculated to reorganize public instruction and education in Russia upon democratic principles. The revision, jointly with the new state commission, of the laws already created by the committee. A revision required by the fact that in editing them the committee had to take into account the bourgeois spirit of previous ministries, which obstructed it even in this its narrowed form. After this revision these laws will be put into effect without any bureaucratic red tape, in the revolutionary order. The pedagogues and the societists, the State Commission welcomes the pedagogues to the bright and honorable work of educating the people, the masters of the country. No one measure in the domain of the people's education ought to be adopted by any power without the attentive deliberation of those who represent the pedagogues. On the other hand, a decision cannot by any means be reached exclusively through the cooperation of specialists. This refers as well to reforms of the institutes of general education. The cooperation of the pedagogues with the social forces, this is how the commission will work both in its own constitution, in the state committee, and in all its activities. As its first task the commission considers the improvement of the teacher's status and first of all of those very poor though almost most important contributors to the work of culture, the elementary school teachers. Their just demands ought to be satisfied at once and at any cost. The proletariat of the schools has in vain demanded an increase of salary to 100 rubles per month. It would be a disgrace any longer to keep in poverty the teachers of the overwhelming majority of the Russian people. But a real democracy cannot stop at mere literacy, at universal elementary instruction. It must endeavor to organize a uniform secular school of several grades. The ideal is, equal and if possible higher education for all the citizens. So long as this idea has not been realized for all. The natural transition through all the schooling grades up to the university, a transition to a higher stage, must depend entirely upon the pupil's aptitude, and not upon the resources of his family. 
The problem of a genuinely democratic organization of instruction is particularly difficult in a country impoverished by a long, criminal, imperialistic war. But the workers who have taken the power must remember that education will serve them as the greatest instrument in their struggle for a better lot and for a spiritual growth. However needful it may be to curtail other articles of the people's budget, the expenses on education must stand high. A large educational budget is the pride and glory of a nation. The free and enfranchised peoples of Russia will not forget this. The fight against illiteracy and ignorance cannot be confined to a thorough establishment of school education for children and youths. Adults, too, will be anxious to save themselves from the debasing position of a man who cannot read and write. The school for adults must occupy a conspicuous place in the general plan of popular instruction. Instruction and education, one must emphasize the difference between instruction and education. Instruction is the transmission of ready knowledge by the teacher to his pupil. Education is a creative process. The personality of the individual is being educated throughout life, is being formed, grows richer in content, stronger and more perfect. The toiling masses of the people, the workmen, the peasants, the soldiers, are thirsting for elementary and advanced instruction. But they are also thirsting for education. Neither the government or the intellectuals nor any other power outside of themselves can give it to them. The school, the book, the theater, the museum, etc., may here be only aids. They have their own ideas, formed by their social position, so different from the position of those ruling classes and intellectuals who have hitherto created culture. They have their own ideas, their own emotions, their own ways of approaching the problems of personality and society. The city laborer, according to his own fashion, the rural twaller according to his, will each build his clear world conception permeated with the class idea of the workers. There is no more superb or beautiful phenomenon than the one of which our nearest descendants will be both witnesses and participants, the building by collective labor of its own general. Rich and free soul. Instruction will surely be an important but not a decisive element. What is more important here is the criticism, the creativeness of the masses themselves. For science and art have only in some of their parts a general human importance. They suffer radical changes with every far-reaching class upheaval. Throughout Russia, particularly among the city laborers, but also among the peasants, a powerful wave of cultural educational movement has arisen. Workers and soldiers' organizations of this kind are multiplying rapidly. To meet them, to lend them support, to clear the road before them is the first task of a revolutionary and popular government in the domain of democratic education. The Constituent Assembly will doubtless soon begin its work. It alone can permanently establish the order of national and social life in our country, and at the same time the general character of the organization of popular education. Now, however, with the passage of power to the Soviets, the really democratic character of the Constituent Assembly is assured. The line which the State Commission, relying upon the State Committee, will follow, will hardly suffer any modification under the influence of the Constituent Assembly. Without predetermining it. The new people's government considers itself within its rights in enacting in this domain a series of measures which aim at enriching and enlightening as soon as possible the spiritual life of the country. The Ministry the present work must in the interim proceed through the Ministry of the People's Education. Of all the necessary alterations in its composition and construction the State Commission will have charge, elected by the Executive Committee of the Soviets and the State Committee. Of course the order of state authority in the domain of the people's education will be established by the Constituent Assembly. Until then, the Ministry must play the part of the executive apparatus for both the State Committee and the State Commission for People's Education. The pledge of the country's safety lies in the cooperation of all its vital and genuinely democratic forces. We believe that the energetic effort of the working people and of the honest enlightened intellectuals will lead the country out of its painful crisis. And through complete democracy to the reign of socialism and the brotherhood of nations. People's Commissar on Education. A. V. Lunacharsky.
on the order in which the laws are to be ratified and published. Until the convocation of the Constituent Assembly, the enacting and publishing of laws shall be carried out in the order decreed by the present Provisional Workmen's and Peasants' Government. Elected by the All-Russian Congress of Workers, Peasants and Soldiers' Deputies. Every bill is presented for consideration of the government by the respective ministry, signed by the duly authorized People's Commissar. Or it is presented by the legislative section attached to the government, signed by the chief of the section. After its ratification by the government, the decree in its final edition, in the name of the Russian Republic, is signed by the President of the Council of People's Commissars. Or for him by the People's Commissar who presented it for the consideration of the government, and is then published. The date of publishing it in the official gazette of the Provisional Workmen's and Peasants' Government, is the date of its becoming law. In the decree there may be appointed a date, other than the date of publication, on which it shall become law, or it may be promulgated by telegraph. In which case it is to be regarded in every locality as becoming law upon the publication of the telegram. The promulgation of legislative acts of the government by the state senate is abolished. The legislative section attached to the Council of People's Commissars issues periodically a collection of regulations and orders of the government which possess the force of law. The Central Executive Committee of the Soviets of Workers, Peasants, and Soldiers' Deputies, Tsai-Ika, has at all times the right to cancel, alter, or annul any of the government decrees. In the name of the Russian Republic, the President of the Council of People's Commissars. V. Yulianov Lenin. 4. The Liquor Problem. Order issued by the Military Revolutionary Committee. Until further order the production of alcohol and alcoholic drinks is prohibited. It is ordered to all producers of alcohol and alcoholic drinks to inform not later than on the 27th INST of the exact site of their stores. All culprits against this order will be tried by a military revolutionary court. The Military Revolutionary Committee. 5. Order No. 2. From the Committee of the Finland Guard Reserve Regiment to all House Committees and to the citizens of Vasily Ostrov. The bourgeoisie has chosen a very sinister method of fighting against the proletariat. It has established in various parts of the city huge wine depots, and distributes liquor among the soldiers, in this manner attempting to sow dissatisfaction in the ranks of the revolutionary army. It is herewith ordered to all house committees, that at three o'clock, the time set for posting this order. They shall in person and secretly notify the president of the committee of the Finland Guard Regiment, concerning the amount of wine in their premises. Those who violate this order will be arrested and given trial before a merciless court, and their property will be confiscated. And the stock of wine discovered will be blown up with dynamite. Two hours after this warning. Because more lenient measures, as experience has shown, do not bring the desired results. Remember, there will be no other warning before the explosions. Regimental Committee of the Finland Guard Regiment. Appendix to Chapter 9. 1. Military Revolutionary Committee. Bulletin No. 2. November 12, in the evening, Kerensky sent a proposition to the revolutionary troops, to lay down their arms. Kerensky's men opened artillery fire. Our artillery answered and compelled the enemy to be silent. The Cossacks assumed the offensive. The deadly fire of the sailors, the Red Guards and the soldiers forced the Cossacks to retreat. Our armored cars rushed in among the ranks of the enemy. The enemy is fleeing. Our troops are in pursuit. The order has been given to arrest Kerensky. Tsarskoy Selo has been taken by the revolutionary troops. The Lettish Rifleman, the Military Revolutionary Committee has received precise information that the valiant Lettish Rifleman have arrived from the front and taken up a position in the rear of Kerensky's bands. From the staff of the Military Revolutionary Committee. The seizure of Gachina and Tsarskoy Selo by Kerensky's detachments is to be explained by the complete absence of artillery and machine guns in these places. Whereas Kerensky's cavalry was provided with artillery from the beginning. 
The last two days were days of enforced work for our staff, to provide the necessary quantity of guns, machine guns, field telephones, etc., for the revolutionary troops. When this work, with the energetic assistance of the district Soviets and the factories, the Putilov works, Obakov and others, was accomplished. The issue of the expected encounter left no place for doubt, on the side of the revolutionary troops there was not only a surplus in quantity and such a powerful material base as Petrograd, but also an enormous moral advantage. All the Petrograd regiments moved out to the positions with tremendous enthusiasm. The Garrison Conference elected a control commission of five soldiers, thus securing a complete unity between the commander-in-chief and the garrison. At the Garrison Conference it was unanimously decided to begin decisive action. The artillery fire on the 12th of November developed with extraordinary force by 3 p.m. The Cossacks were completely demoralized. A parliamentarian came from them to the staff of the detachment at Krasnoy Selo, and proposed to stop the firing, threatening otherwise to take decisive measures. He was answered that the firing would cease when Kerensky laid down his arms. In the developing encounter all sections of the troops, the sailors, soldiers, and the Red Guards, showed unlimited courage. The sailors continued to advance until they had fired all their cartridges. The number of casualties has not been established yet, but it is larger on the part of the counter-revolutionary troops, who experienced great losses through one of our armored cars. Kerensky's staff, fearing that they would be surrounded, gave the order to retreat, which retreat speedily assumed a disorderly character. By 11, 12 p.m. Tsarkoy Selo, including the wireless station, was entirely occupied by the troops of the Soviets. The Cossacks retreated towards Gachina and Kalpino. The morale of the troops is beyond all praise. The order has been given to pursue the retreating Cossacks. From the Tsarskoy Selo station a radio telegram was sent immediately to the front and to all local Soviets throughout Russia. Further details will be communicated. 2. Events of the 13th in Petrograd Three regiments of the Petrograd garrison to take any part in the battle against Kerensky. On the morning of the 13th they summoned to a joint conference 60 delegates from the front, in order to find some way to stop the civil war. This conference appointed a committee to go and persuade Kerensky's troops to lay down their arms. They proposed to ask the government soldiers the following questions. 1. Will the soldiers and Cossacks of Kerensky recognize the Tsai Ee Ka as the repository of governmental power? Responsible to the Congress of Soviets? 2. Will the soldiers and Cossacks accept the decrees of the Second Congress of Soviets? 3. Will they accept the land and peace decrees? 4. Will they agree to cease hostilities and return to their units? 5. Will they consent to the arrest of Kerensky, Krasnov and Savinkov? At the meeting of the Petrograd Soviet, Zinoviev said, it would be foolish to think that this committee could finish the affair. The enemy can only be broken by force. However, it would be a crime for us not to try every peaceful means to bring the Cossacks over to us. What we need is a military victory. The news of an armistice is premature. Our staff will be ready to conclude an armistice when the enemy can no longer do any harm. At present, the influence of our victory is creating new political conditions. Today the socialist revolutionaries are inclined to admit the Bolsheviki into the new government. A decisive victory is indispensable, so that those who hesitate will have no further hesitation. At the city Duma all attention was concentrated on the formation of the new government. In many factories and barracks already revolutionary tribunals were operating, and the Bolsheviki were threatening to set up more of these, and try Gots and Evksentiv before them. Dan proposed that an ultimatum be sent demanding the abolition of these revolutionary tribunals. Or the other members of the conference would immediately break off all negotiations with the Bolsheviki. Shingariev, cadet, declared that the municipality ought not to take part in any agreement with the Bolsheviki. Any agreement with the maniacs is impossible until they lay down their arms and recognize the authority of independent courts of law. Yartsev, for the Yedinstvo group, 
declared that any agreement with the Bolsheviki would be equivalent to a Bolshevik victory. Mayor Schreider, for the Socialist Revolutionaries, stated that he was opposed to all agreement with the Bolsheviki. As for a government, that ought to spring from the popular will. And since the popular will has been expressed in the municipal elections, the popular will which can create a government is actually concentrated in the Duma. After other speakers, of which only the representative of the Mensheviki internationalists was in favor of considering the admission of the Bolsheviki into the new government. The Duma voted to continue its representatives in the Vikshels conference, but to insist upon the restoration of the provisional government before everything. And to exclude the Bolsheviki from the new power. 3. Truce. Krasnov's answer to the Committee for Salvation. In answer to your telegram proposing an immediate armistice, the Supreme Commander, not wishing further feudal bloodshed, consents to enter into negotiations and to establish relations between the armies of the government and the insurrectionists. He proposes to the general staff of the insurrectionists to recall its regiments to Petrograd, to declare the line Ligovo Polkovo Kolpino neutral, and to allow the advance guards of the government cavalry to enter Tsarskoy Selo, for the purpose of establishing order. The answer to this proposal must be placed in the hands of our envoys before eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Krasnov. 4. Events at Tsarskoy Selo. On the evening that Kerensky's troops retreated from Tsarskoy Selo, some priests organized a religious procession through the streets of the town. Making speeches to the citizens in which they asked the people to support the rightful authority, the provisional government. When the Cossacks had retreated, and the first Red Guards entered the town, witnesses reported that the priests had incited the people against the Soviets. And had said prayers at the grave of Rasputin, which lies behind the imperial palace. One of the priests, Father Ivan Kucherov, was arrested and shot by the infuriated Red Guards. Just as the Red Guards entered the town the electric lights were shut off, plunging the streets in complete darkness. The director of the electric light plant, Lubovich, was arrested by the Soviet troops and asked why he had shut off the lights. He was found some time later in the room where he had been imprisoned with a revolver in his hand and a bullet hole in his temple. The Petrograd anti-Bolshevik papers came out next day with headlines, Plekhanov's temperature 39 degrees. Plekhanov lived at Tsarskoy Selo, where he was lying ill in bed. Red guards arrived at the house and searched it for arms, questioning the old man. What class of society do you belong to? they asked him. I am a revolutionist, answered Plekhanov, who for forty years has devoted his life to the struggle for liberty. Anyway, said a workman, you have now sold yourself to the bourgeoisie. The workers no longer knew Plekhanov, pioneer of the Russian social democracy. 5. Appeal of the Soviet Government The detachments at Gachina, deceived by Kerensky, have laid down their arms and decided to arrest Kerensky. That chief of the counter-revolutionary campaign has fled. The army, by an enormous majority, has pronounced in favor of the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, and of the government which it has created. Scores of delegates from the front have hastened to Petrograd to assure the Soviet government of the army's fidelity. No twisting of the facts, no calumny against the revolutionary workers, soldiers, and peasants, has been able to defeat the people. The workers' and soldiers' revolution is victorious. The Tsai Ika appeals to the troops which march under the flag of the counter-revolution, and invites them immediately to lay down their arms, to shed no longer the blood of their brothers in the interests of a handful of landowners and capitalists. The workers, soldiers and peasants' revolution curses those who remain even for a moment under the flag of the people's enemies. Cossacks. Come over to the rank of the victorious people. Railway men, postmen, telegraphers, all, all support the new government of the people. Appendix to Chapter 10. 1. Damage to the Kremlin. I myself verified the damage to the Kremlin which I visited immediately after the bombardment. The little Nikolai Palace, a building of no particular importance, 
which was occupied occasionally by receptions of one of the grand duchesses, had served as barracks for the Junkers. It was not only bombarded, but pretty well sacked, fortunately there was nothing in it of particular historical value. Uspensky Cathedral had a shell hole in one of the cupolas, but except for a few feet of mosaic in the ceiling, was undamaged. The frescoes on the porch of Blagovestchensky Cathedral were badly damaged by a shell. Another shell hit the corner of Ivan Veliki. Chudovsky Monastery was hit about thirty times, but only one shell went through a window into the interior, the others breaking the brick window molding and the roof cornices. The clock over the Spaskaya Gate was smashed. Troitsky Gate was battered, but easily reparable. One of the lower towers had lost its brick spire. The Church of Esti. Basil was untouched, as was the great imperial palace, with all the treasures of Moscow and Petrograd in its cellar, and the crown jewels in the treasury. These places were not even entered. 2. Lunacharsky's Declaration Comrades! You are the young masters of the country, and although now you have much to do and think about, you must know how to defend your artistic and scientific treasures. Comrades! That which is happening at Moscow is a horrible, irreparable misfortune. The people in its struggle for the power has mutilated our glorious capital. It is particularly terrible in these days of violent struggle, of destructive warfare, to be commissar of public education. Only the hope of the victory of socialism, the source of a new and superior culture, brings me comfort. On me weighs the responsibility of protecting the artistic wealth of the people. Not being able to remain at my post, where I had no influence, I resigned. My comrades, the other commissars, considered this resignation inadmissible. I shall therefore remain at my post. And moreover, I understand that the damage done to the Kremlin is not as serious as has been reported. But I beg you, comrades, to give me your support. Preserve for yourselves and your descendants the beauty of our land, be the guardians of the property of the people. Soon, very soon, even the most ignorant, who have been held in ignorance so long, will awake and understand what a source of joy, strength and wisdom is art. 3. Questionnaire for the Bourgeoisie 4. Revolutionary Financial Measure Order In virtue of the powers vested in me by the Military Revolutionary Committee attached to the Moscow Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, I decree All banks with branches, the Central State Savings Bank with branches, and the savings banks at the Post and Telegraph offices are to be opened beginning November 22, from 11 a. M. to 1 p.m. until further order. On current accounts and on the books of the savings banks, payments will be made by the above-mentioned institutions. Of not more than 150 rubles for each depositor during the course of the next week. Payments of amounts exceeding 150 rubles a week on current accounts and savings banks books. Also payments on other accounts of all kinds will be allowed during the next three days, November 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Only in the following cases. a. On the accounts of military organizations for the satisfaction of their needs. b. For the payment of salaries of employees and the earnings of workers according to the tables and lists certified by the factory committees or Soviets of employees. and attested by the signatures of the commissars, or the representatives of the Military Revolutionary Committee, and the District Military Revolutionary Committees. Not more than 150 rubles are to be paid against drafts, the remaining sums are to be entered on current account, payments on which are to be made in the order established by the present decree. All other banking operations are prohibited during these three days. The receipt of money on all accounts is allowed for any amount. The representatives of the Finance Council for the certification of the authorizations indicated in Clause 3 will hold their office in the building of the Stock Exchange, Ilyinka Street. From 10 a. m. to 2 p.m. The banks and savings banks shall send the totals of daily cash operations by 5 p.m. to the headquarters of the Soviet, Skoblev Square, to the Military Revolutionary Committee, for the Finance Council. 
All employees and managers of credit institutions of all kinds who refuse to comply with this decree shall be responsible as enemies of the revolution and of the mass of the population. Before the revolutionary tribunals. Their names shall be published for general information. For the control of the operations of branches of the savings banks and banks within the limits of this decree. The district military revolutionary committees shall elect three representatives and appoint their place of business. Fully authorized commissar of the military revolutionary committee. S. Shevardin Maximenko. Appendix to Chapter 11. 1. Limitations of this chapter. This chapter extends over a period of two months, more or less. It covers the time of negotiations with the Allies, the negotiations and armistice with the Germans, and the beginning of the peace negotiations at Brest-Litovsk. As well as the period in which were laid the foundations of the Soviet state. However, it is no part of my purpose in this book to describe and interpret these very important historical events, which require more space. They are therefore reserved for another volume, Karnilov to Brest-Litovsk. In this chapter, then, I have confined myself to the Soviet government's attempts to consolidate its political power at home. And sketched its successive conquests of hostile domestic elements, which process was temporarily interrupted by the disastrous peace of Brest-Litovsk. 2. Preamble, Declaration of the Rights of the Peoples of Russia. The October Revolution of the Workers and Peasants began under the common banner of emancipation. The peasants are being emancipated from the power of the landowners, for there is no longer the landowner's property right in the land, it has been abolished. The soldiers and sailors are being emancipated from the power of autocratic generals, for generals will henceforth be elective and subject to recall. The workingmen are being emancipated from the whims and arbitrary will of the capitalists, for henceforth there will be established the control of the workers over mills and factories. Everything living and capable of life is being emancipated from the hateful shackles. There remain only the peoples of Russia, who have suffered and are suffering oppression and arbitrariness, and whose emancipation must immediately be begun. Whose liberation must be effected resolutely and definitely. During the period of Tsarism the peoples of Russia were systematically incited against one another. The result of such a policy are known, massacres and pogroms on the one hand, slavery of peoples on the other. There can be and there must be no return to this disgraceful policy. Henceforth the policy of a voluntary and honest union of the peoples of Russia must be substituted. In the period of imperialism, after the March Revolution, when the power was transferred into the hands of the cadet bourgeoisie. The naked policy of provocation gave way to one of cowardly distrust of the peoples of Russia, to a policy of fault-finding, of meaningless, freedom, and equality, of peoples. The results of such a policy are known, the growth of national enmity, the impairment of mutual confidence. An end must be put to this unworthy policy of falsehood and distrust, of fault-finding, and provocation. Henceforth it must be replaced by an open and honest policy leading to the complete mutual confidence of the peoples of Russia. Only as the result of such a trust can there be formed an honest and lasting union of the peoples of Russia. Only as the result of such a union can the workers and peasants of the peoples of Russia be cemented into one revolutionary force able to resist all attempts on the part of the imperialist annexationist bourgeoisie. 3. Decrees on the nationalization of the banks. In the interest of the regular organization of the national economy. Of the thorough eradication of bank speculation and the complete emancipation of the workers, peasants, and the whole laboring population from the exploitation of banking capital. And with a view to the establishment of a single national bank of the Russian Republic which shall serve the real interests of the people and the poorer classes. The Central Executive Committee, Tsai -e -e resolves. The banking business is declared a state monopoly. All existing private joint stock banks and banking offices are merged in the state bank. The assets and liabilities of the liquidated establishments are taken over by the state bank. The order of the merger of private banks in the state bank is to be determined by a special decree. 
the temporary administration of the affairs of the private banks is entrusted to the board of the state bank. The interests of the small depositors will be safeguarded. On the equality of rank of all military men. In realization of the will of the revolutionary people regarding the prompt and decisive abolition of all remnants of former inequality in the army. The Council of People's Commissars decrees. All ranks and grades in the army, beginning with the rank of corporal and ending with the rank of general, are abolished. The army of the Russian Republic consists now of free and equal citizens, bearing the honorable title of soldiers of the Revolutionary Army. All privileges connected with the former ranks and grades, also all outward marks of distinction, are abolished. All addressing by titles is abolished. All decorations, orders, and other marks of distinction are abolished. With the abolition of the rank of officer, all separate officers' organizations are abolished. Note. Orderlies are left only for headquarters, chanceries, committees and other army organizations. President of the Council of People's Commissars. V. L. Yulianov, Lenin. People's Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs. N. Krylenko. People's Commissar for Military Affairs. N. Podvoisky. Secretary of the Council. N. Gorbanov. On the elective principle and the organization of authority in the army. The army serving the will of the toiling people is subject to its supreme representative, the Council of Peoples. Commissars. Full authority within the limits of military units and combinations is vested in the respective soldiers' committees and Soviets. Those phases of the life and activity of the troops which are already under the jurisdiction of the committees are now formally placed in their direct control. Over such branches of activity which the committees cannot assume, the control of the soldiers' Soviets is established. The election of commanding staff and officers is introduced. All commanders up to the commanders of regiments, inclusive, are elected by general suffrage of squads, platoons, companies, squadrons, batteries, divisions, artillery, two, three batteries, and regiments. All commanders higher than the commander of a regiment, and up to the supreme commander, inclusive, are elected by congresses or conferences of committees. 20. The elected commanders above the rank of commander of regiment must be confirmed by the nearest supreme committee. Note. In the event of a refusal by a supreme committee to confirm an elected commander, with a statement of reasons for such refusal, a commander elected by the lower committee a second time must be confirmed. The commanders of armies are elected by army congresses. Commanders of fronts are elected by congresses of the respective fronts. To posts of a technical character, demanding special knowledge or other practical preparation, namely, doctors, engineers, technicians, telegraph and wireless operators, aviators, automobilists, etc. Only such persons as possess the required special knowledge may be elected by the committees of the units of the respective services. Chiefs of staff must be chosen from among persons with special military training for that post. All other members of the staff are appointed by the chief of staff and confirmed by the respective congresses. Note, all persons with special training must be listed in a special list. The right is reserved to retire from the service all commanders on active service who are not elected by the soldiers to any post, and who consequently are ranked as privates. All other functions beside those pertaining to the command, with the exception of posts in the economic departments, are filled by appointment of the respective elected commanders. Detailed instructions regarding the elections of the commanding staff will be published separately. President of the Council of People's Commissars. V. L. Yulianov, Lenin. People's Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs. N. Krylenko. People's Commissar for Military Affairs. N. Podvoisky. Secretary of the Council. N. Gorbanov. On the abolition of classes and titles. All classes and class divisions, all class privileges and delimitations. All class organizations and institutions and all civil ranks are abolished. 
all classes of society, nobles, merchants, petty bourgeois, etc. And all titles, prince, count and others, and all denominations of civil rank, privy state councillor, and others, are abolished. And there is established the general denomination of citizen of the Russian Republic. The property and institutions of the classes of nobility are transferred to the corresponding autonomous zemstvos. The property of merchant and bourgeois organizations is transferred immediately to the municipal self-governments. All class institutions of any sort, with their property, their rules of procedure, and their archives, are transferred to the administration of the municipalities and zemstvos. All articles of existing laws applying to these matters are herewith repealed. The present decree becomes effective on the day it is published and applied by the Soviets of workers, soldiers and peasants deputies. The present decree has been confirmed by the Tsai Ka at the meeting of November 23, 1917, and signed by President of the Tsai Ka Sverdlov President of the Council of People's Commissars V. L. Yulianov, Lenin Executive of the Council of People's Commissars V. Bonchbrovich Secretary of the Council N. Gorbanov On December 3 the Council of People's Commissars resolved to reduce the salaries of functionaries and employees in all government institutions and establishments, general or special. Without exception. To begin with, the Council fixed the salary of a People's Commissar at 500 rubles per month, with 100 rubles additional for each grown member of the family incapable of work. This was the highest salary paid to any government official. 4. Countess Panina was arrested and brought to trial before the First Supreme Revolutionary Tribunal. The trial is described in the chapter on Revolutionary Justice in my forthcoming volume, Karnilov to Brist Litovsk. The prisoner was sentenced to return the money, and then be liberated to the public contempt. In other words, she was set free. 5. Ridicule of the New Regime From Drug Naroda, Menshevik, November 18. The story of the immediate peace of the Bolsheviki reminds us of a joyous moving picture film. Naratov runs, Trotsky pursues, Naratov climbs a wall, Trotsky too, Naratov dives into the water, Trotsky follows, Naratov climbs onto the roof, Trotsky right behind him. Naratov hides under the bed, and Trotsky has him. He has him. Naturally, peace is immediately signed. All is empty and silent at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The couriers are respectful, but their faces wear a caustic expression. How about arresting an ambassador and signing an armistice or a peace treaty with him? But they are strange folk, these ambassadors. They keep silent just as if they had heard nothing. Ola, Ola, England, France, Germany. We have signed an armistice with you. Is it possible that you know nothing about it? Nevertheless, it has been published in all the papers and posted on all the walls. On a Bolshevik's word of honor, peace has been signed. We're not asking much of you, you just have to write two words. The ambassadors remain silent. The powers remain silent. All is empty and silent in the office of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Listen, says Robespierre Trotsky to his assistant Murat Uritsky, run over to the British ambassadors, tell him we're proposing peace. Go yourself, says Murat Uritsky. He's not receiving. Telephone him, then. I've tried. The receiver's off the hook. Send him a telegram. I did. Well, with what result? Murat Uritsky sighs and does not answer. Robes Piotrotsky spits furiously into the corner. Listen, Murat, recommences Trotsky, after a moment. We must absolutely show that we're conducting an active foreign policy. How can we do that? Launch another decree about arresting Naratov, answers Uritsky, with a profound air. Marat, you're a blockhead, cries Trotsky. All of a sudden he arises, terrible and majestic, looking at this moment like Robespierre. Right, Uritsky, he says with severity. 
Write a letter to the British ambassador, a registered letter with receipt demanded. Write. I also will write. The peoples of the world await an immediate peace. In the enormous and empty Ministry of Foreign Affairs are to be heard only the sound of two typewriters. With his own hands Trotsky is conducting an active foreign policy. 6. On the question of an agreement. To the attention of all workers and all soldiers. November 11, in the club of the Preobrazhensky Regiment, was held an extraordinary meeting of representatives of all the units of the Petrograd garrison. The meeting was called upon the initiative of the Preobrazhensky and Semyonovsky regiments, for the discussion of the question as to which socialist parties are for the power of the Soviets. Which are against, which are for the people, which against, and if an agreement between them is possible. The representatives of the Tsai-Ika, of the Municipal Duma, of the Avksentiv Peasant Soviets, and of all the political parties from the Bolsheviki to the Populist Socialists, were invited to the meeting. After long deliberation, having heard the declarations of all parties and organizations, the meeting by a tremendous majority of votes agreed that only the Bolsheviki and the left socialist revolutionaries are for the people, and that all the other parties are only attempting under cover of seeking an agreement, to deprive the people of the conquests won in the days of the Great Workers' and Peasants' Revolution of November. Here is the text of the resolution carried at this meeting of the Petrograd garrison, by 61 votes against 11, and 12 not voting. The Garrison Conference Summoned at the initiative of the Semyonovsky and Preobrazhensky regiments on hearing the representatives of all the socialist parties and popular organizations on the question of an agreement between the different political parties finds that 1. The representatives of the tazi -e ka the representatives of the Bolshevik party and the left socialist revolutionaries, declared definitely that they stand for a government of the Soviets. For the decrees on land, peace and workers' control of industry, and that upon this platform they are willing to agree with all the socialist parties. 2. At the same time the representatives of the other parties, Mensheviki, socialist revolutionaries, either gave no answer at all, or declared simply that they were opposed to the power of the Soviets and against the decrees on land, peace and workers' control. In view of this the meeting resolves. 1. To express severe censure of all parties which, under cover of an agreement, wish practically to annul the popular conquests of the Revolution of November. 2. To express full confidence in the tsai -e ka and the Council of People's Commissars, and to promise them complete support. At the same time the meeting deems it necessary that the comrades left socialist revolutionaries should enter the people's government. 7. Wine Pogroms it was afterward discovered that there was a regular organization, maintained by the cadets, for provoking rioting among the soldiers. There would be telephone messages to the different barracks, announcing that wine was being given away at such and such an address. And when the soldiers arrived at the spot an individual would point out the location of the cellar. The Council of People's Commissars appointed a commissar for the fight against drunkenness, who, besides mercilessly putting down the wine riots, destroyed hundreds of thousands of bottles of liquor. The Winter Palace cellars, containing rare vintages valued at more than five million dollars, were at first flooded, and then the liquor was removed to Kronstadt and destroyed. In this work the Kronstadt sailors, flower and pride of the revolutionary forces, as Trotsky called them, acquitted themselves with iron self-discipline. 8. Speculators. Two orders concerning them. Council of People's Commissars. To the Military Revolutionary Committee. The disorganization of the food supply created by the war. And the lack of system, is becoming to the last degree acute, thanks to the speculators, marauders, and their followers on the railways, in the steamship offices, forwarding offices, etc. Taking advantage of the nation's greatest misfortunes, these criminal spoliators are playing with the health and life of millions of soldiers and workers, for their own benefit. Such a situation cannot be borne a single day longer. 
The Council of People's Commissars proposes to the Military Revolutionary Committee to take the most decisive measures towards the uprooting of speculation, sabotage, hiding of supplies, fraudulent detention of cargoes, etc. All persons guilty of such actions shall be subject, by special orders of the Military Revolutionary Committee, to immediate arrest and confinement in the prisons of Kronstadt. Pending their arraignment before the Revolutionary Tribunal. All the popular organizations are invited to cooperate in the struggle against the spoliators of food supplies. President of the Council of People's Commissaries. V. Yulianov, Lenin. Accepted for execution, Military Revolutionary Committee attached to the CEC of the Soviets of W. and S. Deputies. Petrograd, November 23, 1917. To all honest citizens. The Military Revolutionary Committee decrees. Spoliators, marauders, speculators, are declared to be enemies of the people. The Military Revolutionary Committee proposes to all public organizations, to all honest citizens, to inform the Military Revolutionary Committee immediately of all cases of spoliation, marauding, speculation, which become known to them. The struggle against this evil is the business of all honest people. The Military Revolutionary Committee expects the support of all to whom the interests of the people are dear. The Military Revolutionary Committee will be merciless in pursuit of speculators and marauders. The Military Revolutionary Committee. Petrograd, December 2, 1917. 9. Purishkevich's Letter to Kaldin. The situation at Petrograd is desperate. The city is cut off from the outside world and is entirely in the power of the Bolsheviki. People are arrested in the streets, thrown into the Neva, drowned and imprisoned without any charge. Even Berdzev is shut up in Peter Paul Fortress, under strict guard. The organization at whose head I am is working without rest to unite all the officers and what is left of the Yunker schools, and to arm them. The situation cannot be saved except by creating regiments of officers and Yunkers. Attacking with these regiments, and having gained a first success, we could later gain the aid of the garrison troops. But without that first success it is impossible to count on a single soldier, because thousands of them are divided and terrorized by the scum which exists in every regiment. Most of the Cossacks are tainted by Bolshevik propaganda, thanks to the strange policy of General Dutov, who allowed to pass the moment when by decisive action something could have been obtained. The policy of negotiations and concessions has borne its fruits. All that is respectable is persecuted, and it is the plebe and the criminals who dominate, and nothing can be done except by shooting and hanging them. We are awaiting you here, General, and at the moment of your arrival, we shall advance with all the forces at our disposal. But for that we must establish some communication with you, and before all. Clear up the following points. 1. Do you know that in your name all officers who could take part in the fight are being invited to leave Petrograd on the pretext of joining you? 2. About when can we count on your arrival at Petrograd? We should like to know in order to coordinate our actions. In spite of the criminal inaction of the conscious people here, which allowed the yoke of Bolshevism to be laid upon us, in spite of the extraordinary pig-headedness of the majority of officers. So difficult to organize, we believe in spite of all that truth is on our side. And that we shall conquer the vicious and criminal forces who say that they are acting for motives of love of country and in order to save it. Whatever comes, we shall not permit ourselves to be struck down, and shall remain firm until the end. Purishkevich, being brought to trial before the Revolutionary Tribunal, was given a short prison term. 10. Decree on the Monopoly of Advertisements The printing of advertisements, in newspapers, books, billboards, kiosks. In offices and other establishments is declared to be a state monopoly. Advertisements may only be published in the organs of the Provisional Workers and Peasants Government at Petrograd, and in the organs of local Soviets. The proprietors of newspapers and advertising offices, as well as all employees of such establishments, should remain at their posts until the transfer of the advertisement business to the government, 
superintending the uninterrupted continuation of their houses. And turning over to the Soviets all private advertising and the sums received therefore, as well as all accounts and copy. All managers of publications and businesses dealing with paid advertising, as well as their employees and workers, shall agree to hold a city congress, and to join, first the city trade unions. And then the all-Russian unions, to organize more thoroughly and justly the advertising business in the Soviet publications, as well as to prepare better rules for the public utility of advertising. All persons found guilty of having concealed documents or money, or having sabotaged the regulations indicated in paragraphs 3 and 4, will be punished by a sentence of not more than three years' imprisonment, and all their property will be confiscated. The paid insertion of advertisements, in private publications, or under a masked form, will also be severely penalized. Advertising offices are confiscated by the government, the owners being entitled to compensation in cases of necessity. Small proprietors, depositors and stockholders of the confiscated establishments will be reimbursed for all monies held by them in the concern. All buildings, officers, counters, and in general every establishment doing a business in advertising should immediately inform the Soviet of workers and soldiers deputies of its address. And proceed to the transfer of its business, under penalty of the punishment indicated in paragraph 5. President of the Council of People's Commissars V. L. Yulianov, Lenin. People's Commissar for Public Instruction. A. V. Lunacharsky. Secretary of the Council. N. Gorbanov. 11. Obligatory Ordinance. The city of Petrograd is declared to be in a state of siege. All assemblies, meetings and congregations on the streets and squares are prohibited. Attempts to loot wine cellars, warehouses, factories, stores, business premises, private dwellings, etc., etc., will be stopped by machine gun fire without warning. House committees, doormen, janitors and militiamen are charged with the duty of keeping strict order in all houses, courtyards and in the streets. And house doors and carriage entrances must be locked at 9 o'clock in the evening, and opened at 7 o'clock in the morning. After nine o'clock in the evening only tenants may leave the house, under strict control of the house committees. Those guilty of the distribution, sale or purchase of any kind of alcoholic liquor, and also those guilty of the violation of sections 2 and 4, will be immediately arrested and subjected to the most severe punishment. Petrograd, 6th of December, 3 o'clock in the night. Committee to Fight Against Pogroms, attached to the Executive Committee of the Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies. 12. Two Proclamations. Lenin, to the people of Russia. Comrades Workers, Soldiers, Peasants, All Toilers. The Workers and Peasants Revolution has won at Petrograd, at Moscow. From the front and the villages arrive every day, every hour, greetings to the new government. The victory of the revolution, is assured, seeing that it is sustained by the majority of the people. It is entirely understandable that the proprietors and the capitalists, the employees and functionaries closely allied with the bourgeoisie, in a word. All the rich and all those who join hands with them, regard the new revolution with hostility, oppose its success, threaten to halt the activity of the banks, and sabotage or obstruct the work of other establishments. Every conscious worker understands perfectly that we cannot avoid this hostility. Because the high officials have set themselves against the people and do not wish to abandon their posts without resistance. But the working classes are not for one moment afraid of that resistance. The majority of the people are for us. For us are the majority of the workers and the oppressed of the whole world. We have justice on our side. Our ultimate victory is certain. The resistance of the capitalists and high officials will be broken. No one will be deprived of his property without a special law on the nationalization of banks and financial syndicates. This law is in preparation. Not a worker will lose a single kopeck. On the contrary, he will be assisted. Without at this moment establishing the new taxes. 
The new government considers one of its primary duties to make a severe accounting and control on the reception of taxes decreed by the former regime. Comrades workers. Remember that you yourselves direct the government. No one will help you unless you organize yourselves and take into your own hands the affairs of the state. Your Soviets are now the organs of governmental power. Strengthen them, establish a severe revolutionary control, pitilessly crush the attempts at anarchy on the part of drunkards, brigands, counter-revolutionary Junkers and Cornilovists. Establish a strict control over production and the accounting for products. Arrest and turn over to the revolutionary tribunal of the people everyone who injures the property of the people, by sabotage in production, by concealment of grain reserves. Reserves of other products, by retarding the shipments of grain, by bringing confusion into the railroads, the posts, and the telegraphs. Or in general opposing the great work of bringing peace and transferring the land to the peasants. Comrades workers, soldiers, peasants, all toilers. Take immediately all local power into your hands. Little by little, with the consent of the majority of peasants, we shall march firmly and unhesitatingly toward the victory of socialism. Which will fortify the advance guards of the working class of the most civilized countries, and give to the peoples an enduring peace, and free them from every slavery and every exploitation. 13. To all workers of Petrograd. Comrades. The revolution is winning, the revolution has won. All the power has passed over to our Soviets. The first weeks are the most difficult ones. The broken reaction must be finally crushed, a full triumph must be secured to our endeavors. The working class ought to, must, show in these days the greatest firmness and endurance, in order to facilitate the execution of all the aims of the new people's government of Soviets. In the next few days decrees on the labor question will be issued, and among the very first will be the decree on workers' control over the production and regulation of industry. Strikes and demonstrations of the worker masses in Petrograd now can only do harm. We ask you to cease immediately all economic and political strikes, to take up your work, and do it in perfect order. The work in the factories and all the industries is necessary for the new government of Soviets, because any interruption of this work will only create new difficulties for us. And we have enough as it is. All to your places. The best way to support the new government of Soviets in these days, is by doing your job. Long live the iron firmness of the proletariat. Long live the revolution. Petrograd Soviet of W and S. D. Petrograd Council of Trade Unions. Petrograd Council of Factory Shop Committees. 14. Appeals and Counter-Appeals. From the employees of the state and private banks to the population of Petrograd. Comrades workers, soldiers and citizens. The Military Revolutionary Committee in an extraordinary notice is accusing the workers of the state and private banking and other institutions of impeding the work of the government. Directed towards the ensuring of the front with provisions. Comrades and citizens, do not believe this calumny, brought against us, who are part of the general army of labor. However difficult it be for us to work under the constant threat of interference by acts of violence in our hard-working life. However depressing it be to know that our country and the revolution are on the verge of ruin, we, nevertheless, all of us, from the highest to the lowest, employees, artelschiki, counters, laborers, couriers, etc., are continuing to fulfill our duties which are connected with the ensuring of provisions and munitions to the front and country. Counting upon your lack of information, comrades workers and soldiers, in questions of finance and banking, you are being incited against workers like yourselves. Because it is desirable to divert the responsibility for the starving and dying brother soldiers at the front from the guilty persons to the innocent workers who are accomplishing their duty under the burden of general poverty and disorganization. Remember, workers and soldiers. The employees have always stood up for and will always stand up for the interests of the toiling people, part of which they are themselves. And not a single kopeck necessary for the front and the workers has ever been detained and will not be detained by the employees. 
From November 6 to November 23, i.e., during 17 days, 500 million rubles were dispatched to the front, and 120 millions to Moscow, besides the sum sent to other towns. Keeping guard over the wealth of the people, the master of which can be only the constituent assembly, representing the whole nation. The employees refuse to give out money for purposes which are unknown to them. Do not believe the calumniators calling you to take the law into your own hands. Central Board of the All-Russian Union of Employees of the State Bank Central Board of the All-Russian Trade Union of Employees of Credit Institutions To the Population of Petrograd Citizens, do not believe the falsehood which irresponsible people are trying to suggest to you by spreading terrible calumnies against the employees of the Ministry of Supplies and the workers in other supply organizations who are laboring in these dark days for the salvation of Russia. Citizens. In posted placards you are called upon to lynch us, we are accused falsely of sabotage and strikes, we are blamed for all the woes and misfortunes that the people are suffering. Although we have been striving indefatigably and uninterruptedly, and are still striving, to save the Russian people from the horrors of starvation. Notwithstanding all that we are bearing as citizens of unhappy Russia, we have not for one hour abandoned our heavy and responsible work of supplying the army and population with provisions. The image of the army, cold and hungry, saving our very existence by its blood and its tortures, does not leave us for a single moment. Citizens. If we have survived the blackest days in the life and history of our people, if we have succeeded in preventing famine in Petrograd. If we have managed to procure to the suffering army bread and forage by means of enormous, almost superhuman, efforts. It is because we have honestly continued and are still continuing to do our work. To the last warning of the usurpers of the power we reply, it is not for you who are leading the country to ruin to threaten us who are doing all we can not to allow the country to perish. We are not afraid of threats, before us stands the sacred image of tortured Russia. We will continue our work of supplying the army and the people with bread to our last efforts, so long as you will not prevent us from accomplishing our duty to our country. In the contrary case the army and the people will stand before the horrors of famine, but the responsibility therefore belongs to the perpetrators of violence. Executive Committee of the Employees of the Ministry of Supplies To the Chinovniki, Government Officials It is notified hereby that all officials and persons who have quitted the service in government and public institutions or have been dismissed for sabotage or for having failed to report for work on the day fixed, and who have nevertheless received their salary paid in advance for the time they have not served, are bound to return such salary not later than on November 27, 1917, to those institutions where they were in service. In the event of this not being done, these persons will be rendered answerable for stealing the Treasury's property and tried by the Military Revolutionary Court. The Military Revolutionary Committee. December 7, 1917. From the Special Board for the Supplies. Citizens. The conditions of our work for the supplying of Petrograd are getting more and more difficult every day. The interference with our work, which is so ruinous to our business, of the commissars of the Military Revolutionary Committee is still continuing. Their arbitrary acts, their annulling of our orders, may lead to a catastrophe. Seals have been affixed to one of the cold storages where the meat and butter destined for the population are kept, and we cannot regulate the temperature so that the products would not be spoilt. One carload of potatoes and one carload of cabbages have been seized and carried away no one knows where to. Cargoes which are not liable to requisition, calva, are requisitioned by the commissars and, as was the case one day, five boxes of calva were seized by the commissar for his own use. We are not in a position to dispose of our storages, where the self-appointed commissars do not allow the cargoes to be taken out and terrorize our employees, threatening them with arrest. All that is going on in Petrograd is known in the provinces, and from the Don, from Siberia, from Voronezh and other places people are refusing to send flour and bread. This cannot go on much longer. The work is simply falling out of our hands. Our duty is to let the population know of this. 
To the last possibility we will remain on guard of the interests of the population. We will do everything to avoid the oncoming famine, but if under these difficult conditions our work is compelled to stop, let the people know that it is not our fault. 15. Elections to the Constituent Assembly in Petrograd There were 19 tickets in Petrograd. The results are as follows, published November 30th. Party. Vote. Populist Socialists. 19,109. Cadets. 245,006. Christian Democrats. 3,707. Bolsheviki. 424. 027. Socialist Universalists. 158. S. D. N. S. R. Ukrainian and Jewish Workers. 4,219. League of Women's Rights. 5,310. Socialist Revolutionaries, Aberantsi. 4,696. Left Socialist Revolutionaries. 152. 230. League of the People's Development. 385. Radical Democrats. 413. Orthodox Parishes. 24,139. Feminine League for Salvation of Country. 318. Independent League of Workers. Soldiers, Peasants. 4,942. Christian Democrats, Catholic. 14,382. Unified Social Democrats. 11,740. Mensheviki. 17,427. Yedinstvo Group. 1,823. League of Cossack Troops. 6. 712. 16. From the Council of People's Commissars to the Toiling Cossacks. Brothers Cossacks. You are being deceived. You are being incited against the people. You are told that the Soviets of workers, soldiers and peasants' deputies are your enemies, that they want to take away your Cossack land, your Cossack liberty. Don't believe it, Cossacks. Your own generals and landowners are deceiving you, in order to keep you in darkness and slavery. We, the Council of People's Commissars, address ourselves to you, Cossacks, with these words. Read them attentively and judge yourselves which is the truth and which is cruel deceit. The life and service of a Cossack were always bondage and penal servitude. At the first call of the authorities a Cossack always had to saddle his horse and ride out on campaign. All his military equipment a Cossack had to provide with his own hardly earned means. A Cossack is on service, his farm is going to rack and ruin. Is such a condition fair? No, it must be altered forever. The Cossacks must be freed from bondage. The new people's Soviet power is willing to come to the assistance of the toiling Cossacks. It is only necessary that the Cossacks themselves should resolve to abolish the old order, that they should refuse submission to their slave driver officers, landowners, rich men. That they should throw off the cursed yoke from their necks. Arise, Cossacks. Unite. The Council of People's Commissars calls upon you to enter a new, fresh, more happy life. In November and December in Petrograd there were all Russian congresses of Soviets of soldiers, workers, and peasants' deputies. These congresses transferred all the authority in the different localities into the hands of the Soviets, i.e., into the hands of men elected by the people. From now on there must be in Russia no rulers or functionaries who command the people from above and drive them. The people create the authority themselves. A general has no more rights than a soldier. All are equal. Consider, Cossacks, is this wrong or right? We are calling upon you, Cossacks, to join this new order and to create your own Soviets of Cossacks deputies. To such Soviets all the power must belong in the different localities. 
not to hetmans with the rank of general, but to the elected representatives of the toiling Cossacks, to your own trustworthy reliable men. The all-Russian congresses of soldiers, workers, and peasants' deputies have passed a resolution to transfer all landowners' land into the possession of the toiling people. Is not that fair, Cossacks? The Karnilovs, Kaladins, Dutovs, Karolovs, Bardizes, all defend with their whole souls the interests of the rich men. And they are ready to drown Russia in blood if only the lands remain in the hands of the landowners. But you, the toiling Cossacks, do not you suffer yourselves from poverty, oppression and lack of land? How many Cossacks are there who have more than four, five desiatins per head? But the landowners, who have thousands of desiatins of their own land, wish besides to get into their hands the lands of the Cossack army. According to the new Soviet laws, the lands of Cossack landowners must pass without compensation into the hands of the Cossack workers, the poorer Cossacks. You are being told that the Soviets wish to take away your lands from you. Who is frightening you? The rich Cossacks, who know that the Soviet authority wishes to transfer the landowners' lands to you. Choose then, Cossacks, for whom will you stand, for the Karnilovs and Kaladins, for the generals and rich men, or for the Soviets of peasants, soldiers, workers and Cossacks deputies? The Council of People's Commissars elected by the All-Russian Congress has proposed to all nations an immediate armistice and an honorable democratic peace without loss or detriment to any nation. All the capitalists, landowners, generals Kornilovists have risen against the peaceful policy of the Soviets. The war was bringing them profits, power, distinctions. And to you, Cossack privates? You were perishing without reason, without purpose, like your brother's soldiers and sailors. It will soon be three years and a half that this accursed war has gone on, a war devised by the capitalists and landowners of all countries for their own profit, their world robberies. To the toiling Cossacks the war has only brought ruin and death. The war has drained all the resources from Cossack farm life. The only salvation for the whole of our country and for the Cossacks in particular is a prompt and honest peace. The Council of People's Commissars has declared to all governments and peoples, we do not want other people's property, and we do not wish to give away our own. Peace without annexations and without indemnities. Every nation must decide its own fate. There must be no oppressing of one nation by another. Such is the honest, democratic, people's peace which the Council of People's Commissars is proposing to all governments, to all peoples, allies and enemies. And the results are visible, on the Russian front an armistice has been concluded. The soldiers and the Cossacks' blood is not flowing there any more. Now, Cossacks, decide. Do you wish to continue this ruinous, senseless, criminal slaughter? Then support the cadets, the enemies of the people, support Chernov, Tseretelli, Skoblev, who drove you into the offensive of July 1. Support Karnilov, who introduced capital punishment for soldiers and Cossacks at the front. But if you wish a prompt and honest peace, then enter the ranks of the Soviets and support the Council of People's Commissars. Your fate, Cossacks, lies in your own hands. Our common foes, the landowners, capitalists, officers Kornilovists, bourgeois newspapers, are deceiving you and driving you along the road to ruin. In Orenburg, Dutov has arrested the Soviet and disarmed the garrison. Kaldin is threatening the Soviets in the province of the Don. He has declared the province to be in a state of war and is assembling his troops. Korolov is shooting the local tribes in the Caucasus. The cadet bourgeoisie is supplying them with its millions. Their common aim is to suppress the people's Soviets, to crush the workers and peasants, to introduce again the discipline of the whip in the army. And to eternalize the bondage of the toiling Cossacks. Our revolutionary troops are moving to the Don and the Ural in order to put an end to this criminal revolt against the people. The commanders of the revolutionary troops have received orders not to enter into any negotiations with the mutinous generals, to act decisively and mercilessly. Cossacks. On you depends now whether your brother's blood is to flow still. We are holding out our hand to you. 
join the whole people against its enemies. Declare Kaldin, Karnilov, Dutov, Karolov and all their aiders and abettors to be the enemies of the people, traitors and betrayers. Arrest them with your own forces and turn them over into the hands of the Soviet authority, which will judge them in open and public revolutionary tribunal. Cossacks. Form Soviets of Cossacks deputies. Take into your toil-worn hands the management of all the affairs of the Cossacks. Take away the lands of your own wealthy landowners. Take over their grain, their inventoried property and livestock for the cultivation of the lands of the toiling Cossacks, who are ruined by the war. Forward, Cossacks, to the fight for the common cause of the people. Long live the toiling Cossacks. Long live the union of the Cossacks, the soldiers, peasants and workers. Long live the power of the Soviets of Cossacks, soldiers, workers and peasants deputies. Down with the war. Down with the landowners and the Kornilovist generals. Long live peace and the brotherhood of peoples. Council of People's Commissars. 17. From the Commission on Public Education attached to the Central City Duma. Comrades Workingmen and Working Women. A few days before the holidays, a strike has been declared by the teachers of the public schools. The teachers side with the bourgeoisie against the workers and peasants' government. Comrades, organize parents' committees and pass resolutions against the strike of the teachers. Propose to the ward Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies, the trade unions, the factory shop and party committees, to organize protest meetings. Arrange with your own resources Christmas trees and entertainments for the children, and demand the opening of the schools, after the holidays, at the date which will be set by the Duma. Comrades, strengthen your position in matters of public education, insist on the control of the proletarian organizations over the schools. Commission on Public Education Attached to the Central City Duma. 18. Diplomatic Correspondence of the Soviet Government. The notes issued by Trotsky to the Allies and to the neutral powers. As well as the note of the Allied military attaches to General Dukhanin, are too voluminous to give here. Moreover they belong to another phase of the history of the Soviet Republic, with which this book has nothing to do, the foreign relations of the Soviet government. This I treat at length in the next volume, Karnilov to Brest-Litovsk. 19. Appeals to the Front Against Dukhanin The struggle for peace has met with the resistance of the bourgeoisie and the counter-revolutionary generals. From the accounts in the newspapers, at the Stavka of former Supreme Commander Dukhanin are gathering the agents and allies of the bourgeoisie, Verkovsky, Avksentiev, Chernov, Gotz, Tseretelli. Etc. It seems even that they want to form a new power against the Soviets. Comrade soldiers. All the persons we have mentioned have been ministers already. They have acted in accord with Kerensky and the bourgeoisie. They are responsible for the offensive of July 1 and for the prolongation of the war. They promised the land to the peasants and then arrested the land committees. They re-established capital punishment for soldiers. They obey the orders of French, English and American financiers. General Dukhanin, for having refused to obey orders of the Council of People's Commissars, has been dismissed from his position as Supreme Commander. For answer he is circulating among the troops the note from the military attaches of the Allied imperialist powers, and attempting to provoke a counter-revolution. Do not obey Dukhanin. Pay no attention to his provocation. Watch him and his group of counter-revolutionary generals carefully. 20. From Krylenko. Order No. 2. The ex-Supreme Commander, General Dukhanin, for having opposed resistance to the execution of orders. For criminal action susceptible of provoking a new civil war, is declared enemy of the people. All persons who support Dukhanin will be arrested, without respect to their social or political position or their past. Persons equipped with special authority will operate these arrests. I charge General Manikovsky with the execution of the above-mentioned dispositions. Appendix to Chapter 12 1. Instruction to Peasants 
in answer to the numerous inquiries coming from peasants. It is hereby explained that the whole power in the country is from now on held by the Soviets of the workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies. The workers' revolution, after having conquered in Petrograd and in Moscow, is now conquering in all other centers of Russia. The workers' and peasants' government safeguards the interests of the masses of peasantry, the poorest of them. It is with the majority of peasants and workers against the landowners, and against the capitalists. Hence the Soviets of peasants' deputies, and before all the district Soviets, and subsequently those of the provinces, are from now on and until the Constituent Assembly meets. Full-powered bodies of state authority in their localities. All landlords' titles to the land are cancelled by the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets. A decree regarding the land has already been issued by the present Provisional Workers' and Peasants' Government. On the basis of the above decree all lands hitherto belonging to landlords now pass entirely and wholly into the hands of the Soviets of peasants' deputies. The Volost, a group of several villages forms a Volost, land committees are immediately to take over all land from the landlords, and to keep a strict account over it. Watching that order be maintained, and that the whole estate be well guarded. Seeing that from now on all private estates become public property and must therefore be protected by the people themselves. All orders given by the Volist Land Committees, adopted with the assent of the District Soviets of Peasants' Deputies, in fulfillment of the decrees issued by the revolutionary power, are absolutely legal and are to be forthwith and irrefutably brought into execution. The Workers' and Peasants' Government appointed by the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets has received the name of the Council of People's Commissars. The Council of People's Commissars summons the peasants to take the whole power into their hands in every locality. The workers will in every way absolutely and entirely support the peasants, arrange for them all that is required in connection with machines and tools. And in return they request the peasants to help with the transport of grain. President of the Council of People's Commissars. V. Yulianov, Lenin. Petrograd, November 18, 1917. 2. The full-powered Congress of Peasant Soviets met about a week later, and continued for several weeks. Its history is merely an expanded version of the history of the Extraordinary Conference. At first the great majority of the delegates were hostile to the Soviet government, and supported the reactionary wing. Several days later the assembly was supporting the moderates with Chernov. And several days after that the vast majority of the Congress were voting for the faction of Maria Spiridonova, and sending their representatives into the Tsai-Ika at Smolny. The right wing then walked out of the Congress and called a Congress of its own, which went on, dwindling from day to day, until it finally dissolved.